from a senseless murder-suicide to the devastating aftermath of a controversial police maneuver, these four 911 calls will take you on a roller coaster of emotions. If seeing your child grow into a young adult and begin to make their own way in life is one of the most rewarding things for a parent, witnessing them choose a path of destruction must be the most difficult. Shortly after 2.30 a.m. on February 23, 2015, a man called 911 after his 23-year-old son shot his girlfriend in the head and fled the family home. The distraught father asked the police to shoot his son when they found him. 911? Yeah, please. Uh, my address is 1417 Hollywood. My son and his girlfriend, they just had an argument. I think he shot her. Please. She's still breathing. Please send somebody. Okay. Is, are you by her right now? Yeah, yeah. We by her. Hello, hello. I stand up and believe so. I stand up and believe so. Okay. Does he still have the gun? I don't know. He's, uh, he's outside. I don't know. Please, she's, she's still breathing. Where did you shoot her at? At her head. In her head? Yeah. Did you get something to stop the bleeding? Yeah, my wife, she's uh, she's with a towel. Okay, tell her to keep she's, pressure firmly applied. Don't don't take it off bleeding. the hook. Okay, okay, tell her to keep pressure to the head where, he's, okay, where she's shot. Okay, okay. She is. Hope that it's just more. It's hard. Just keep pressure applied really firmly. Yes, she is. Honey. She is. Okay. Does he still have the gun on him? I well, I believe he uh, he he took off. He took off outside. Okay. Do you know what he's wearing? Back, I hope he, he's wearing a dress and black jacket. And if the police is around, please shoot him right there. Don't even don't even try to. You said a black but, jacket. A black jacket and a hat. Would you please hurry up? Okay. What is his name? His name is Amir. I am E R. Amir, what's his last name? Ahmad. A H M A D. Okay. Is she still breathing? Yes, she's still breathing. Would you please hurry up? Okay. Did you see which way he took off out of the house? I don't know. From the back door. Okay. Holy, holy. She's still breathing. Please. Okay. They're they're on the way to you. <laughs> Is she conscious? Does she talk to you guys? No, she's not talking. She's breathing. She is still breathing? Is the first. She's still breathing. She's still breathing. He doesn't know. And you don't know if the gun is in the house or if he took I it? I don't know, honey. I was asleep. My wife woke me up. I'm just... I don't know. Where's the gun? Inside, okay. outside. Can you I don't know. anywhere around her or... I don't know. Where is that rock? She doesn't know. The police is here. Okay, we can hang up. Don't, I don't hang up. Carly, she's breathing. If he's outside, I want you to shoot that bitch right there. Shoot him right there. Bro, I'm good. I'm good. I am sitting on a couch. Sir, sir, just cooperate with the officers. Do I am. I mean, you know, I don't really think I did it. He's outside. Don't shoot him right there. I know, but just if they're asking you to sit down, just sit down right now. Okay, I am I'm sitting down. Okay, they just need to get everything under control, okay? Oh, my God. Okay, I need to talk to the officers. Okay, we can hang up. Okay, boy. All right, bye. When police arrived at the home on Olivewood Avenue, the suspect ran around the back of the house and into a neighbor's backyard. Before police could reach him, they heard a single gunshot. The shooter had turned the gun on himself and was pronounced dead at the scene. Officers who entered the residence found his girlfriend, 21-year-old Sarah Jamal Mahmood, bleeding from a shot to the head. She was still breathing and was rushed to the nearby Metro Health Medical Center. A stretch of Olivewood Avenue was closed from Detroit Avenue to Franklin Boulevard to preserve the scene. Mahmoud remained in a critical condition, and she died later the same day. The 21-year-old victim was remembered by loved ones as full of love and joy, always helping others. She was even planning on making assisting others her career, and had been studying for a nursing degree when she was murdered. 
The nursing student was buried at Crown Hill Cemetery and Mausoleum after her parents, Jamal and Maria, sisters Heather and Tammy, her nieces, nephews, and wider family said their tearful goodbyes. Those gathered at the killer's funeral service prayed for his forgiveness before his body was buried at Rest Haven Memory Gardens in Lorain County, Ohio. For more incredible 911 calls, subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up so you won't miss the next one. This next call will break your heart. In 2007, an intruder broke into a home in Rineyville, Kentucky and gunned down all three adults in the house. As bullets rang through the air, nine-year-old Matthew Pete hid in a closet with his younger brother and sister, too terrified to move until morning when he called 911. 911. Somebody broke into our house um, um, last night, and um, I don't know who it was, but um, but they killed everybody here except for my my sister, my brother, and me. Okay, and what happened now? Um, there was a guy with a pistol or some kind of gun, and he came in and uh, shot my mother and my grandma. Those were the only ones here. And you're there now? And they, and they also killed one of my grandma's dogs, so we still have three dogs left. Um, Did you just now come home? No. Were you there last night? Yes, I was just afraid to call. Stay on the line, okay? I'm going to take you to the police department. Okay. Kentucky State Police 911. Yes, um, there was a break in um, that last night. I was afraid to call, and um, the, they, shot, they shot the only two people here, which was my grandma and my mom. In what county? Ronnieville, Kentucky. In Ronnieville? Mm -hmm. What's going on right now? Um, nothing. I was just afraid to call, so, uh, last night. Okay. And did the police come out last night? No. They didn't? No. And who was shot last night? Um, my mom and my, um, grandma. Your mom and grandma? Yes. And, and one of my, um, grandma's dogs. Uh, um, the only people here are me, my sister, and my brother. How old is your sister and your brother? My sister's like a um, few months old. My brother's only just four. How old are you? Uh, nine. Where were they taken last night? Did the police come? No, they weren't taken. They were shot in my house. Okay. And did they go to the doctor? No. Where are they at right now? They're in my house. There's blood splattered everywhere. Do you know who done this? No. You don't know? Have you been there all night by yourself? Yes, with my brother and sister. Okay, honey, you stay on the line, okay? Okay. Jody Shacklett, the 911 call operator who answered his call, couldn't quite believe what she was hearing, so it took her a while to grasp that it wasn't a prank. Yet, despite the unimaginable horrors the young caller had experienced the previous night, he showed remarkable courage when speaking to the 911 operator and made sure she understood he needed help. I hear a couple gunshots going through and uh, some glass breaking and my grandma screaming that she's dying. I hear a couple more shots and then I'm down on the couch, shocked. Never really thought this would be happening. Shacklett soon realized the severity of the call, later telling WLKY News, I looked at my co-workers and knew we had a situation. Her supervisor then took over the call. She told the news station, I know that call by heart. You don't forget calls like that. When authorities arrived, they found the bodies of the 31-year-old mother, Tracy Burke, and 53-year-old grandmother, Karen Comer. The children were taken to safety. The intruder was the young caller's stepfather and U.S. Army Sergeant, Brent Burke. At the time of the murders, Brent and Tracy Burke were in the middle of getting divorced. The Burke's marriage had been tumultuous, but the newly single mother had recently moved in with the Comers, and she was getting on with her life. Her divorce would have been finalized four days after the murders. Karen Comer was the mother of Burke's first husband, Michael Pete. It was his son who had hid during the massacre with his younger siblings and later called 911. When Comer's daughter heard of her mother's and her ex-sister-in-law's brutal murders, she told the news enterprise, 
When I heard my mom was shot, I knew it was Brent Burke, she said. He was always capable of this. Burke had allegedly threatened to kill his soon-to-be ex-wife, and during a conversation with her mom just a few days before the shootings, she tried to encourage her not to stay in the home in fear of him making good on his threats. Burke was buried in Kirby Flat Cemetery. Following his mother's brutal murder, nine-year-old Matthew Pete said, the feeling of being loved by my mom is by far my overarching memory of her. I think about my mom multiple times a day, every single day, I miss her. After his mother was taken so violently, Pete moved in with his father and they moved to California. Kurt Comer, who lost his wife, continued to live in the house where she died because they had built it together. Eight years after the horrific night of September 11, 2007, Pete met the 911 call operator who answered his call when he was awarded a 911 Hero Award for his bravery in 2015. When the Kentucky Emergency Services Conference announced the beginning of an annual award for children who bravely called 911, Dispatch Supervisor Kim Lewis didn't hesitate to nominate Pete. By this time, Pete was a 17-year-old high school senior and was considering a career in law enforcement in his future. When accepting the award, Pete first thanked Shacklett and then directed his gratitude to the officers who helped him that night. The world would be a much worse place if it weren't for all the things you do. Thank you, all of you dispatchers, all of the detectives, all of the officers. Thank you, he said. At first, the teen wasn't convinced he deserved an award, commenting, I thought, I don't think I deserve this. I don't think I did something courageous enough to deserve this. But 911 dispatcher Shacklett saw it differently. He needs to know what a hero he really is, she said. At nine, he couldn't really comprehend what an impact he had on people's lives. In 2017, Pete told the news enterprise that he hadn't spoken to the killer over the last 10 years and never intended to. He continues to get therapy, which he says, not only has helped me work through emotional instabilities, but also has enhanced my ability to process everything else that comes my way. When asked about his mother and grandmother, Pete said, about as important as it is to live life, I can't be either of them. It's physically impossible for me to reach that level of compassion and selflessness that they possessed. But I try my best to be the best human being I can, as they did. He added, My best memory occurred almost weekly, but truly described who she was. After my brother and sister would lie down for nap time, my mother would make sure to bring out a board game, whether it was life, my favorite, Clue, or her favorite, Trivial Pursuit. We played a lot of Trivial Pursuit, and I believe it's where I get a lot of the random facts I know. After two mistrials, two hung juries, and some charges being dropped and others arising, Burke was convicted by a U.S. military court and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole at Fort Leavenworth Prison in Kansas. The convicted double murderer has since been transferred to U.S. Penitentiary in Pine Knot, where he continues to serve his life sentence. In a perfect world, everyone would have loved ones to take care of them when they reach old age. But sadly, we don't live in a perfect world. After being sent home from a rehab center, 81-year-old cancer patient Clarence Blackman found himself home alone and hungry. With his shelves bare and physically unable to get to the store, the sick man reached out for help. Hey, the 911 with that, Mr. Emergency. Okay. Last time I spoke to you was about 3.30 in the morning on January the 2nd, 2014. And they rushed me to the hospital. Now, that's the first time I've been home in this apartment since that time. Now, here is a problem. I'm not imperiled upon life or limb, but what I need is someone to get to the grocery store and bring me some food because I need to eat something. I don't really, I don't need to be transported. I'm here, a place at family, but I would like to get somebody from the college to bring me some uh, small order and so I can get something to eat. Now, I realize transporting you in a, that's how I was transported in a vehicle 
number 24, outstanding, outstanding group of men. So I don't know how you can handle this without getting out of your bleaking line going and in, in this mm-hmm. table. Okay. But I do need some emergency services here. Okay, what is your name, sir? Oh, wait, one moment, Mr. One moment, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, man. Yes, we're we're going to get someone out there to you. Um, one second. So you need someone to bring the food to you? Yes, please. I, I, I have. I just. I can barely walk. I mean, we're holding on to a chair, and when John in my wheelchair, here's a couple of ideas. Just what I, I would like to uh, call it to bring me. I like a one fresh cabbage, uh, avocado. Two bananas and three Pepsi's. What, pe- what kind of Pepsi? Like, I, I don't, I don't know diet stuff. I wouldn't. No, I mean uh, two liters or the, the, the big bottle or whatever that is. Uh, and you want three of that? Three of those. And they they have an excellent uh, thing of a uh, what they call processed ham. It looks like bologna, but it's actually um, uh, actually ham. And they got a pack of that. And uh, maybe a pack of uh, the uh, ready prepared uh, potato salad. Maybe a, a can of beets and a can of uh, green beans. And I believe, oh yes, and this is my absolute favorite in the entire world. Stage two popcorn. I, I love that. I, I like it. And uh, I believe that'll have a hold me. Maybe I'll, I'll think of um, tomato juice. And they could get that over the dock so that I could stir up something. And the these uh, television people are on their way to uh, get my television going, so I, I don't know how you can handle it. But oh, I, I'm not sure either. I'm going to send someone out there to talk with you, okay? That sounds like a good idea, my friend, because I have met some fantastic people with 911. That those boys that took me there. Thank God they, they had to blow the door first to get me out. And, oh, goodness. And anyway, I got to the hospital about 4 a.m. And uh, But I'm, I'm recovering pretty well. i oh. here in Cape Fear Valley, and I just left uh, the uh, Covenant uh, uh, Physical Rehab place, and they let me go and uh, all that. So I, I, I'm doing better. So you could get me started there. Maybe I can get everything organized. But uh, How old are you? Pardon me? How old are you? I'm 81. Oh. I'll be 82. Come on. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. And I tell you what, thing, buddy. That crew y'all sent for me that night. Uh-huh. And crew, crew 24. That is what stands at the group of boys. But anyway, me and me. But anyway, so whatever you can do to help, I'll be I can't do anything. I can't go anywhere. Okay. I can't get out of my damn chair. Okay. So you can't, you can't walk. Well, do you have any, what other, what kind of medical conditions do you have? Well, now that I'm home, uh-huh. I have a, uh, I'm in a weakened state. Uh-huh. I can walk with assistance, and I think I've overcome all the other things. I couldn't even walk when I got to the hospital, but now I can walk around the, with my walker inside the building and, and do it fairly well. So once I get something here, I can manage it, because this, this apartment is made for assisted living, yeah, mm-hmm. it's flat, no steps, mm-hmm. uh, so it's made for, for people like me. That oh, yeah, that's good. Now, you said, did you say apartment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are your doors unlocked? I lock the front door is unlocked. Okay. I'll look forward to somebody coming, okay? All right, we'll get someone out there to talk with you, okay? Okay, buddy. All right, feel better. Thank you. Bye-bye. The elderly man was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2008. Back then, his wife, Wanda, was still alive, but she passed away from cancer in 2011. In May 2015, when he was released from the rehab center, he weighed just over 115 pounds and had been told by doctors that he had less than a year to live. Usually, when a patient who needs assistance leaves a treatment facility, the Department of Social Services is informed to arrange home help. But when Blackman was discharged, the private rehab center failed to take this critical step. With no immediate family in the area, the U.S. Army veteran was left with no other option than to call 911. 
the woman who took his call, Marilyn Hinson, couldn't send EMS to buy groceries, but she could. Hungry. I've been hungry. A lot of people can't say that, but I have. You know, and I cannot stand to see anybody go hungry. Hinson noted down his modest request for a cabbage, some cans of beans and beets, some popcorn, tomato juice, and a soft drink. And then, after getting permission from her supervisor, she headed to the store. Two Fayetteville police officers helped her deliver the shopping to the gentleman, who was overwhelmed by their help. It was like a little miracle ringing in my ear, and I thought, well, Jesus, you've answered all those prayers. At just over 115 pounds, it is no stretch to say Blackman is skin and bones and cancer. I got critical cancer. However, the 911 operator's kindness didn't end there. Instead, she said about making him a stack of ham sandwiches, which the recently hospitalized man called a feast. The story was picked up by local media and quickly went viral. People from as far as Canada began to answer his call for help. Calling us directly, folks are calling our call center, folks are dialing 911, basically saying, How can we help Mr. Blackman? So People started to call Blackman too. Team cabbage and pulled sausage tomorrow. The other one is, the, is the baked chicken and uh, fresh cucumbers and tomatoes. Speaking to the Huffington Post, the widower said, I've been receiving cards and packages, and people have been showing up at my door with bags of groceries. He felt truly blessed, and his kitchen was soon overflowing with more food than he could ever eat. I want to have every person that goes to bed hungry under a bridge. At least they can go by Salvation Army. They may have to listen to a sermon, but they get some food. Blackman was visited by a social services worker who arranged for a home health nurse to see him twice a week to ensure he didn't slip through the cracks again. HuffPost reported that Meals on Wheels would bring him weekly meals. When the reporter asked how he was, the grateful cancer patient replied, I'm okay now. Right now, it's just wonderful to be loved. I can lay down to sleep at night and say, Lord, they care. They really care. Charlie Moore was driving home when an unidentified Georgia state trooper pulled him over. Despite there being two children in Moore's car, the traffic stop escalated into a high-speed police chase that ended with a controversial police maneuver and the death of 12-year-old Leiden Boykin. Because Moore had instructed his 14-year-old son to call 911 after he was pulled over, much of the devastating incident was recorded in the following call. However, the boys' voices have been redacted due to their age. County 911, what's the address to your emergency? You're being chased by who? Okay. What kind of vehicle are you in? You're on Nebo Road? What kind of vehicle are you in? Okay, are you driving the car or are you the passenger? Okay, do you know if the car is silver or black or anything like that? All right, ma'am. Are you... Okay, so are you, are you not stopping for the cop? Are you, you're the passenger, correct? Is the driver refusing to stop? Do I ask her to pull over? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what's your first and last name? I understand. I've let them know that I'm on the phone with you. What's your first and last name? What? what what did you say your name was? Okay. Does the driver know that you're on the phone with me? Okay. Do you know why he ran? Okay. 
the officers are telling me to tell you to pull over and they're going to hit you if they don't. I'm not taking one. I'm going to be wrong. I'm Okay, I'll put in there, do you want a supervisor? But in order to talk to the supervisor, you're going to have to pull over, okay? I asked for a supervisor, and they're okay and violent. They, they broke my window. In order to speak to a supervisor, you're going to have to pull over. I'll notate that you want to speak to a supervisor. I need you to help. Give me the phone. I need you to help me now because I need doing the wrong. I got three officers. going to have to pull over so you can speak to their supervisors, okay? We already have a supervisor en route to that area, okay, sir? Okay. They've already been notated. They've already been notified, okay? Okay, well, please dispatch your officers that have me right now and tell them that they need to get them off of me right now because I'm scared. I got my kids with me right now. I'll let them know that you have your kids with you, but again, they are asking you to pull over, and you would need to pull over in order to speak to the officer that's on the way, okay? No, I am, I am afraid. I'm afraid for my life. Do you hear me? I'm a black man that asked for a reason for being pulled over, and they wouldn't give me that. And then they broke my glass. Y'all gotta help me out, Y'all gotta help me. Y'all gotta help me. I didn't do nothing wrong. I've let them know what you're telling me, okay? In order, there's already a supervisor in route, but in order to speak so, to that supervisor, okay, you have to be stopped. Okay, well, tell them to fill out, no. I got my kids with me, man. I've already let them know that there are kids in the car, okay? Oh, my God. Yo, and they're trying to fill my car, man. He's telling me to... Hello? Can I get some help, please? My wife is on the phone freaking out. No, no, I need help. I need help. This ain't fair. This ain't fair. Sir, I can't make them... I can't make them do anything. All I can let do is let them know what you're telling me. There's already been... Okay, so... A, there's already been a supervisor, supervisor notified and en route to your area. What area? To where you are driving. We, we, sir, we do have supervisor that's in the area. Uh-uh. No, I don't trust y'all. I don't trust y'all. I'm asking for your help, and y'all not doing that. Again, I've already let them know that you want a supervisor. <laughs> Am I good to disconnect? being notified, okay? We've already got rescue and fire notified, okay? I'm going to go ahead and disconnect. The incident happened in the early hours of September 10th, 2021. 
When the 35-year-old father had been driving back from working a night shift, both boys were in his care. However, the 12-year-old who died was his neighbor's son. When their son was killed in the accident, they were away attending a family funeral. Granny, I'm on my way. I'm almost home. At least can come. After stopping Moore's vehicle, the Georgia State Trooper called for backup and was soon met by Paulding County Sheriff's Office deputy. According to a police statement, the driver refused to lower his driver window or produce any type of identification. When Moore continued to refuse to open his window, the deputy smashed it. Moore then allegedly told the officers he was a sovereign citizen and drove away, reportedly running over the deputy's foot. He later said he absconded because he was afraid of what the run-in with police might turn into. The state trooper claimed he believed Moore was under the influence of alcohol, said he wouldn't comply, and then took off along Highway 92. The police then pursued and carried out the pit maneuver. The intention of a pit maneuver is to clip the rear of the vehicle to make it spin out, but on this occasion, it caused Moore's Kia Sorento to flip several times. A Paulding County sergeant said the dispatcher couldn't get the message that there were children in the vehicle to the officers in time because different radio systems were used. The sergeant theorized that the trooper didn't see the boys in the car because it was dark. Moore and his son were given first aid at the scene before being taken to the hospital to be treated for their minor injuries. The parents of the victim claimed they weren't notified about the crash that killed their child by police or told who had identified his body. Instead, Moore's wife told them about the accident and their son's death. They believe the driver holds some responsibility, but the family also questions the actions of the police. Boykin's grieving father spoke to 11 Alive News, saying, why was he considered so dangerous that they had to flip that car with them kids in there? Why did he make that decision? And why did he decide to flip that car knowing there was kids in there? But they couldn't put a roadblock up and protect those kids. They couldn't figure out any other way than to flip that car over. When asked about the police chase, heartbroken mother Tony Franklin Boykins said they could have called that off. She told reporters that her son was robbed of his life and told NBC, I don't know how to deal with this going forward. She believed Moore was in fear when he drove away from the police. And he said, I need for y'all to get a supervisor out here. There's too many police cars and I'm in fear of my life. An emailed police statement said in part, the pursuit continued at a high rate of speed, and the driver was driving recklessly. The trooper terminated the chase by using the pursuit immobilization technique, PIT. The Kia exited the roadway and overturned in a ditch. The rear seat passenger was unrestrained and suffered fatal injuries. Moore was arrested following the deadly crash and held at Paulding County Jail, where he remains in custody. He is charged with murder during the commission of a felony first-degree homicide by vehicle, aggravated assault against a peace officer, driving on a suspended license, having an open container in a motor vehicle, and was given a DUI for refusing a breathalyzer. The crash is being investigated by the Georgia Department of Public Safety's Office of Professional Standards, who routinely looks into all fatal collisions. At a gathering for his son, Anthony Boykins asked God to keep us away from accidents, surround us with positive energy, an opportunity. His mom said, he was the sweetest kid that was taken away from me. Speaking on behalf of the shattered family, Chelsea Mills vowed, we'll make sure Leiden gets the proper justice and that we will make sure everyone is held accountable. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting and subscribe to join us in the next episode of True 911.